In this video, we're going to begin Chapter 7 of our Laplace transform methods. And in Section 7.1, we're just going to introduce Laplace transforms as well as their inverses. I want to stress that in Section 7.1, we're actually not going to talk about differential equations at all. Rather, introduce these transforms and their inverses. And then in the subsequent section, we'll talk about how they can be used as a tool to solve initial value problems for differential equations. So first, let's just introduce what a Laplace transform is formally. And so it's defined via an improper integral. So given a function f of t defined for all positive t, the, Lap the Laplace transform of f is the function capital F defined as follows. So the first thing that I want to emphasize is we're starting with a function in t. And then our Laplace transform will be a function in s. So we will switch variables through this um, format. And then the Laplace transform is both represented by the capital F, but also the script L with the curly braces. So those are um, synonymous uh, notations. And then the actual definition is the integral from zero to infinity of e to the negative s t times f of t dt. So again, I just want to call to your attention, this s is built into this formula as part of the definition of the Laplace transform, but the actual um, integral is in terms of t, and that occurs here in two places, both in the function for which you're transforming, as well as that exponential function. So you'll integrate in terms of t, but your final answer will be in terms of s after you've applied the limits of integration. Um, one thing that seems like not a big deal, but really is important to emphasize here is this last clause for all values of s for which the improper integral converges. It's really easy to forget about this. And so you go through the process of computing this improper integral, but you must give a restriction on s. And so we'll see that in action here in this next example. So for this example, apply the definition to find directly the Laplace transform of the given function. So we have a very harmless looking function, f of t equals t squared. We would like to find the transform. And so what we're going to do here is, and I'm, I'm going to use all of my possible margins because this is kind of a lengthy problem. So budget your white space accordingly. So you can either watch or you can either list the Laplace transform as capital F of S or you can use the script L notation. Um, and so I'll use T squared here. And then we're going to plug this T squared in for F of T right up above here. So let me clean this off. So we have the integral from zero to infinity of E to the negative S T times t squared dt. All right, so we have a couple of things going on with this integral. First of all, we have this glaringly obvious infinite limit of integration. So that means we're going to have to handle that with, a, uh, with um, a limit in front. That is an improper integral from calc 2. Secondly, we need to take a look at this integrand and identify what the best way forward is as far as a technique of integration. So what I see is a product of two functions. There isn't a standard u substitution that's going to work here. So generally, when you see products of functions, you think integration by parts. So recall we have our acronym for integration by parts, LIPIT, and it's in decreasing order of how you should choose your u for the um, integration by parts. And so the L is for logarithms, I is for inverse trig functions, P is for polynomials, E is for exponential, and T is for trig. So when we look at what we have here, we have an exponential function and we have a polynomial. So polynomial beats out exponential. So we're going to let U be T squared. And then everything left over becomes DV. So that is E to the negative ST DT. And then let's fill in our grid here. du is going to be a 2t dt. And then the integral of e to the negative st. Um, if I were to take the derivative with respect to t, it would pop out a negative s, but I'm taking the integral, so it pops out a negative 1 over s, e to the negative st. 
So here's our setup for integration by parts. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a look at this infinite limit of integration and I'm gonna take care of it with a limit in front. So let's write this as the limit as B goes to infinity. And now let's go ahead and set up our um, integral after using by parts. So I get UV would be a negative T squared over S E to the negative S T. And this is from zero to B. UV minus the integral of V DU. So actually I have a double negative here. And then V DU is a two T over S e to the negative st dt. All right, so at this point, I always like to pause for a moment and ask myself, was this an appropriate integration by parts? Did I actually improve where I was from before? And so you'll notice before, we had our exponential function and then we had a quadratic polynomial. Now we're left with still an exponential function, but only a linear polynomial. So we were able to reduce that polynomial um, by one degree, and so we did make um, some headway here. However, we still have a product of a polynomial and um, an exponential function. So this means that we're gonna have to use a second integration by parts. So let's go ahead and set up a second one. We're still gonna let our polynomial be our u. And then everything else is our dv. So that's going to be e to the negative st dt. Squeeze it in there. And so when I take the derivative, remember this is with respect to t, my du2 is going to be a 2 over s dt. And then my v2 is going to be, again, a negative 1 over s e to the negative st. All right, let me look back over here at this first term. And if I were to apply the limits of integration, of course I need to plug the B in for the two T values, but notice that the zero is gonna drop out because of this polynomial up front. So I can rewrite my limit. This term just becomes a negative B squared over S E to the negative S B. And again, that zeroth term dropped off. And now I'm gonna be starting my second integration by parts. And so I have uv gives me a negative two over s squared e to the negative st. There's my uv minus v du. So, whoops, uv, hold on, let's fix that. I did v du here. So let's do uv. uv is going to be a negative 2t over s squared e to the negative st. Okay, uv minus, which is going to become a plus integral, 0 to b of v du. So now we're getting a negative 2 over s squared e to the negative st dt. All right. So here's where we're at after our second application of integration by parts. And so again, we ask ourselves, oh and shoot, I already took care of that negative sign. We ask ourselves, um, are we on the right track? Did this help? Yes, it did. We now only have a single T in our integrand, so we can integrate that integral there directly. And then I did just forget to put in my limits of integration there, so let's not forget those. Once again, this zero is gonna drop out because of this t here, so the b is the only thing that's gonna live on. So let's see where we're at. Being careful to include my limit everywhere. I'm gonna copy my first term, and then plug in b for the second term. And then finally, integrating here. Again, we've integrated this function two times before in our integration by parts. It's going to pop out a negative 1 over s. So this becomes a minus 2 over s cubed e to the negative st. And then integrate from 0 to b. 
It's important to note here that this zero term does not drop out. So we need to make sure that we take care of that here. So, whoops, let's go back to black. So let's see where we're at. I'm going to rewrite these first couple of terms. And then plugging in, I have a minus 2 over s cubed e to the negative sb. And then when I plug in 0, I just get out minus a negative, so plus 2 over s cubed. All right, and I think I got it all. And so now I want to apply this limit. So we're looking at all of the b's here. And this term doesn't have any b's at the end, so it's going to be the limit of a constant. This term here has only a single b. And so if we think of the negative exponential function, e to the negative x, then that function dies out as x goes towards infinity. So as long as this s right here is positive, this exponential function is going to die to zero. And so that's going to be part of our clause that we're making the assumption that s is positive. If s is negative, this then becomes the standard exponential function, and this integral would not converge. It would go to infinity. So we're going to assume that s is positive. These other two terms have b's in several places. So what that means is you can't just blindly assume that these things are going to go to zero. You should justify it. So to see that, what I'll do is I'll write this as the limit b goes to infinity. And oops, I'll write this as a negative b squared over s e to the, ne uh, to the positive s b now. And then similarly here. And then we decided the next term went to zero and the next term was a constant. So I'll leave those out here. All right, so for these remaining terms that are left in the limit here, um, right now we have an infinity over infinity situation. So if you applied L'Hopital's rule twice to this first term and only once to the second term, what you'll see is eventually that numerator is going to go to a constant after you apply L'Hopital's rule enough and the denominator is always going to be heading towards infinity. So if you assume L'Hopital's rule twice in the first one and once in the second, you will see that these will go to zero. And so we conclude that our final Laplace trans transform is 2 over s cubed with the important assumption that s is greater than 0, else these exponential functions will be flip-flopped in the opposite way. And so I just want to kind of reiterate here that s greater than 0 ensures e to the negative sb goes to zero as b goes to infinity. All right, so that's where that restriction is coming from. All right, so if I back out a bit, we stand back and we look at this and we say, that was absolutely terrible. For a very simple looking function, that escalated really quickly. Um, so we find out quickly that maybe computing Laplace transforms directly isn't the best bet. And so we'll address that on the next page. Um, but next, let me look at one more example here, number eight, and it looks a little bit different because all I'm providing you with is a graph. And so we have the graph of a function and we want to know how to take this function and then transform it into a Laplace transform. So before we do that, let's actually write out this function as a piecewise function. So we have three pieces to this function. It is zero when t is between zero and one. It jumps up to one when t is between one and two, and then it is zero past two. 
So here is our function. The good news is when f of t is zero, as it is on the top and bottom, if you go back up here to the formal definition, if we're multiplying by zero here, then we're integrating zero and our final answer is zero. So what that tells us is we really only need to focus on this piece of the function because that's the only non-zero Laplace transform that we're gonna have here. So let's zero in on that. So I have f of s, which can also be expressed as the Laplace transform of one, is going to be the integral from zero to infinity of, we always have out front e to the negative st, and then in this particular case, we just have one stuck in here. And hallelujah, we can integrate this directly without any kinds of shenanigans here. So first of all, I'll go ahead and just put my limit as b goes to infinity, and I'll just assume here that this infinity is actually a b with my limit out front. And then the integral of e to the negative s is a negative one over s e to the negative st, and then this is from zero to b. And so what I get here is the limit as b goes to infinity of negative one over s e to the negative sb. And then when I plug in zero, I get minus a negative or plus one over s. All right, and so, oh shoot, doggy, I made a mistake. So um, let me back the train up here for a moment. Um, previously here, we were finding the Laplace transform um, for all t greater than or equal to zero. So if I come back up here, I want to emphasize in the definition we had, assuming that a function is defined for all t greater than or equal to zero, then this is how we define our Laplace transform. If we look down below at this example, the mistake that I made was um, we actually have a restricted domain on this function and I should have been more careful here. So instead of having limits from zero to infinity, we actually want those limits to be restricted from one to two. So I do apologize. Let me go ahead and correct this here. It does make our life a little bit easier because we now don't need this improper integral. So let's now make this from one to two. The integrand is still fine. The, uh, our application of integration is still correct. And then let's just fix these values right here. And I will just erase this bottom line. All right. So instead of zero to infinity, we have one to two. And so now let's go ahead and plug in. I have a negative one over s e to the negative two s, and then minus a negative or plus one over s e to the negative s. And so you can leave your answer like this, or you could write it as e to the negative s minus e to the negative 2s over s. Um, and then again, ask yourself, was there any kind of a restriction that you needed here? And um, here we'll just need that s is greater than zero. All right. Um, and I just want to give a shout out here to these types of step functions. They're actually very applicable in um, outside disciplines. For example, if you're working with the circuit, you would either have power on or power off. And so you're typically zeroing out until you flip the switch and then you have power and then come back down. So these are a typical example of a type of function that you would see um, working with Laplace transforms. All right, so now that we've been through the horror of directly computing a Laplace transform, let's talk about how we can save ourselves some time here and avoid some of those heavy computations. So this next theorem says that the Laplace transform behaves nicely. And what I mean by behaving nicely is that um, the Laplace transform distributes across sums and constants can also be pulled out front. So that's going to save us some time in as far as um, 
uh, computation time. Rather than plugging in these very large functions, we can break them down across sums and differences and pull out these constants to simplify our computations. We also need to introduce um, something called the gamma function here. And this is a function that pops up in other areas, not just in Laplace transforms. And so again, this letter here is the capital Greek letter gamma. Um, and it's defined, as you can see, kind of similar to a Laplace transform. Um, and so we're not going to work with the actual definition much, but rather we're going to be focusing more on the properties of this gamma function. And so you can see some of these properties here right away. It says gamma of 1 is equal to 1, and this you could just prove directly through the um, using the definition. If you want to reduce the inner argument on your gamma function, you can drop it by one, but you pay for it with an X out front. And that'll be an important property that we'll use over and over. We have a similar property um, here down below. N is assumed to be an integer. And if you are taking gamma of an integer, you can directly spit out N factorial, where that is one less than the integer inside your gamma function. And then finally, we have kind of this goofy value here that gamma of one half is equal to the square root of pi. So what, what this does is it gives you two properties to use with the gamma function, as well as two explicit values for the gamma function. So you don't need to compute gamma of one or gamma of one half by hand via the definition. You can just use those um, since we're stating them as fact. So now what we want to do is we want to give a list of all of the standard Laplace transforms for common functions so that we can utilize these and avoid having to go through that um, computationally taxing integral formula. So you can see all of these listed. Um, a couple of things that I want to point out here. Um, in the third value here, n is assumed to be an integer whereas a is any real number. All right, so that's the difference between those two. Um, and then of course here we have the hyperbolic trig functions, which we haven't worked with a lot, but they do pop up here and there, so I included them as well. Even if you don't have a lot of familiarity with um, hyperbolic sine and cosine, you can still manipulate them via um, uh, Laplace transforms. Uh, and then, this u function is a step function, kind of like the function that we just worked with in number eight. The only other thing that I wanted to point out here are the restrictions on s. For almost all of them, we are requiring s to be positive. However, we do have these two separate restrictions on the hyperbolic trig functions there where s needs to be greater than the absolute value of k. And that's so that those denominators there don't become negative. All right, so um, I will never require you to memorize any of the properties up here or any of these tables. So I want you to be comfortable working with them, but don't worry about memorizing them for any upcoming exams. All right, so for 14, use the given table to find the Laplace transform of the function. So look at the small amount of white space I have allotted. That's always a good sign. So let's take a look at this. We want to find capital F of S. So that is the Laplace transform of, I'll just write F of T. All right, so first thing that we know is we know that the Laplace transform can distribute across sums and differences. So I can express this as the Laplace transform of t to the 3 halves minus the Laplace transform of e to the negative 10t. All right, so now we've boiled it down to finding two individual Laplace transforms. Let's look back up at our table and see which of these, um, which of these entries in the table is going to be utilized in these cases. So let me just clean up my table. All right, so let's focus first on t to the 3 halves. That exponent is not an integer, so we're going to have to look at the t to the a1. And so let's go ahead and write that out. That is gamma of our a value, which is 3 halves plus 1 
divided by s to the 5 halves. And now let's look at our second function, e to the negative 10t. That's going to fall into this category with a equal negative 10. So this is going to become a 1 over s plus 10. All right. So this is a start, but we never want to leave our answers in terms of the gamma function. So we would like to reduce this down to just a function in s, no gammas involved. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to utilize um, this property up here. Let me clean this up as well. All right, so let's util utilize this property, which says we can drop the gamma function by one, but we pay for it with an x out front. So what I want to do is drop this one and this 3 halves is the x that's going to come out front. All right, so this is 3 halves, gamma of 3 halves. And of course, we still have our denominator. And then I'll just rewrite this ending piece. All right, so we've reduced our gamma by 1 but our answer right now is still in terms of gamma, which isn't good. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm just gonna note that remember that three halves is the same as one half plus one. So we can use this exact same property of the gamma function, dropping by one and popping a one half out in order to reduce that gamma function to a one half. So this becomes, we still have our three halves here, but now we're gonna pop a one half out to pay for reducing this to a gamma of one half. And now we're in great shape because we know the value of gamma of one half, and that's right up here at the top of the screen, square root of pi. So we have three square root of pi over four, s to the 5 halves plus 1 over s plus 10. And then both of these have the restriction where s is supposed to be positive. So we'll include here where s is positive. And I am just noticing one other error. I'm not on my A game here with you guys. This negative did not get carried over. So please do correct this. These should all be negatives in between. Just notice that small error at the very end. All right, but otherwise, pretty quick and painless here, um, utilizing both the properties of the gamma function as well as this table of inverse or of Laplace transforms. Let's do one more example of finding transforms via the table. And so we'll do a sine of 2t and cosine of 2t function. So again, let me look back up top here. And we're, whoops, we're going to be looking at these two functions, of course, where k is going to equal 2 in both cases. And there's not much else to it on this one. There's not a lot of manipulation. So what I'll say first is our Laplace transform f of s is L of F of T, which is the Laplace transform of sine of 2T plus the Laplace transform of cosine of 2T. And so that is according to the formula. So the sine function is a K over S squared plus K squared, where our K is two. And the cosine function has an s on top, otherwise it's the same. So s over s squared plus 4. And again, the restriction on both of these is s positive. All right. So we've seen two examples of computing Laplace transforms directly and two examples of computing Laplace transforms um, via the table. 
And so now to finish off the notes, I would like to um, introduce inverse Laplace transform. So just as we can take a function and find its Laplace transform, we can also move backwards from a Laplace transform and recover the original function. And so that's precisely what we would like to do here. And so we just, in the, notationally speaking, we just introduced the Laplace transform as the script L with the inverse uh, negative one exponent. So um, again, we're still going to be using the table to find these. And so now we want to uh, work backwards to find the inverse Laplace transform of 24, which is the function um, s to the negative 3 halves. So my goal in this is to rewrite capital F of s in such a way that it looks like something in this table right here. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look at this and I'm going to say, well, what's my best bet? what can I take s to the negative 3 halves power and make it look like? So for example, I can never make s to the negative 3 halves power look like 1 over s. I can make it look like 1 over s to the 3 halves, but not 1 over s. So this function is out, this function is out. I can't make it a 1 over s to the n plus 1 because I have a fractional exponent, but this one's looking promising because it has the s to the uh, a plus one on bottom. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna write this as a one over s to the three halves, which could then be written as a one over s to the one half plus one. So now I go back up here and I say, all right, well now I have the denominator, but I'm missing the numerator. So I need a gamma of one half plus one up there. So make it so. I'm going to multiply by gamma of one half plus one, but if I do that on top, I need to also do that on bottom. So now what I'd like to do is group these together, and I know what the inverse Laplace transform of the red circled stuff is. So now let me just take care of the denominator, and I'm just going to use my properties of the gamma function to reduce that. So first I'll write out what I like, the things that I know how to invert. And then I have, I'm gonna use the property where I can reduce this one by popping out a one half. And then we have the property that this is the square root of pi. And so now at this point, I can say oops, that the inverse Laplace transform, little f of t, which is L inverse of f of s, is equal to, when we go back up here, we had this t to the a. So in our case, a is 1 half. So I have a t to the 1 half power, and then times this coefficient here, which is a 1 over the square root of pi over 2, or a 2 over the square root of pi. All right, so this is our inverse Laplace transform. I believe the book does like to simplify it and write it as 2 square root of t over pi. But whichever you choose is perfectly fine with me. All right, so we have one more example here of computing an inverse Laplace transform. The first thing that I'm gonna note is we have this s squared plus four on the bottom, which looks very reminiscent of example 16 here at the top of the screen. So we've, we're definitely gonna to wanna to utilize sines and cosines here, but the question is which one will we need and how can we rewrite it? So let's take a look. All right, so since we know we want to use a sine and a cosine function, um, when we look back up to our table, we see that the cosine function has an s on top, whereas the sine function has a constant on top. When we look at our example that we're working with, we actually have both of those things on top. We have a term with an s and a term with a constant. So what we'll do first is we will go ahead and split this up into two fractions in this way, and then we're gonna handle them both separately. So let's write it in this format. Oops. Let's write it as three times 
s over s squared plus 4 plus 1 over s squared plus 4. Now, this first term here is great, right? That's what we see right up here, and that's directly a cosine of 2t. So we really don't have to work much harder to recover that inverse Laplace transform. However, for this second one, um, we would like for it to have a k on top, right? We're missing this 2 on top. So <coughs> let's make it so. Stick a 2 over 2 in there. And so then that's going to leave us with a 3 times s over s squared plus 4. And then a 1 half times 2 over s squared plus 4. And so, so far here, right, we have equality, equality. This is still our transformed function. We want to find the inverse. So now I'm going to say that f of t, which is the inverse Laplace transform of capital F of s, is equal to 3 times. We have the cosine function up above, so cosine of 2t. And then we have 1 half times the sine of 2t function. All right, and there it is. Not too bad. You just have to do, it's almost like working backwards in algebra. You're making it more complicated so that it fits the bill of one of the um, functions in your table. That concludes our exercises for this section. Um, I want to end here with a couple of definitions, which we'll, we will see have even more weight in the following section in 7.2. So first, we say that a function is piecewise continuous on a bounded interval if it can be divided into finitely many subintervals so that it is, number one, continuous in the interior of each of these subintervals, and it has a finite limit as it approaches each endpoint. So all this is saying is, you don't have any infinite discontinuities, and in finitely many pieces, we have this, this continuity. So um, there aren't, for example, infinitely many jumps. It's okay if there are some jumps. So for example, we had that function that was 0, 1, 0. That's okay. That's piecewise continuous if we break it up at those jumps. We just can't have infinitely many of them. So we wanted to introduce um, piecewise continuous. Then we also have the term exponential order. So it says a function f of t is set to be of exponential order as t goes to infinity if there exists non-negative constants m, c, and t such that the function that you care about when you take its absolute value is bounded by some exponential function. And so, um, again, they're not telling you what these constants are. It's just saying, if you can find those constants, m, e, c to the t, that are non-negative, so that is a positive exponential function that's increasing, then it means you're of exponential order if you can always be bounded by some other function. So this just, in some way, um, bounds a function from growing too rapidly, essentially. And then on page, or on theorem two here, we're going to talk about why we care about those definitions. And it says, if the function is piecewise continuous and is of exponential order, then its Laplace transform exists. So this is an important theorem because it gives us reason to, uh, um, or it gives us motivation to study Laplace transforms and whether we know if a function actually would exist or not. Um, a corollary says if f of t satisfies the hypotheses of theorem 2, that is if it's piecewise continuous and of exponential order, then the limit as s goes to 0 of the Laplace transform equals 0. So this is kind of a nice thing to check where if you're computing a Laplace transform directly, you can see if it's not approaching 0 as s goes to infinity, you made a mistake. And then finally, it says, suppose that the functions f of t and g of t satisfy the hypotheses of theorem 2 so that their Laplace transforms capital F and capital G exist. Fine. If f equals g for all s values, then the inverses or the original functions, little f and little g, are equal um, wherever on 0 to infinity both f and g are continuous. 
So what this is saying in kind of a wordy way is the only way you can get identical Laplace begin with. So you're never going to take transitions, transform them, and get the same Laplace transform out. So that way it's a very well-defined transform. All right, that concludes our notes for section 7.1. We just have one more section left in the semester, 7-2, and that's where we're going to relate Laplace transforms back to differential equations and see how to use them as a tool of solving DEs.